Welcome to Just Want a Quilt, a research podcast coming out of Tulane University Law School, where we explore all kinds of things, stories about quilting, tools, field trips, maybe some famous quilters stop by, and of course, a little bit of copyright thrown in just for fun. This is Elizabeth Townsend Gard. I'm a law professor at Tulane University Law School, and I just want to quilt. Today we talk to Brandy Carl. She is the coolest. She knows everything. She knows everything. She's always known everything. She's like one of those people who knows everything. Anyways, um, Brandy came to stay with us, and we had a long chat with her about copyright. She is a lawyer and a uh, law li- uh, a librarian. She is the copyright person for Penn State. She oversees a huge amount of stuff um, and she's just insanely cool. So Brandy's going to tell it like it is and we're going to have a lot of fun talking about copyright. Um, My name is Brandy Carl. Mm -hmm. I'm the copyright officer at Penn State University Libraries and I am a copyright lawyer Mm -hmm. who works in academia and I know a little bit about copyright. You know a lot about copyright. Because you also have done a lot of other things too, right? Yes. What else have you and done? Uh, I'm not really a quilter, uh-huh. but um, my my chosen craft is is embroidery. So oh, interesting. Yeah. Hand embroidery. Yeah. Do you ever do machine embroidery? No. Do you think that machine embroidery is evil and inappropriate? Do you like not no. think it's cool? No, my aunt does it. And yeah, she it puts it? things on. It's really cool. On towels and yeah. stuff for me. That's awesome. That's I do. It's awesome. Yeah. All right, cool. So you're here visiting, and I've forced you to now talk on the podcast because that's, you know, the price of admission, I think, when everybody comes around me at this point. So. One podcast per night on the couch. <laughs> totally. Exactly. Um, so we're going to start talking, teaching people about copyright. And I find it a little, like, I don't know, I keep putting it off. So, well, we have, first I have to ask you the question we ask everybody which is, do you have a memory of someone sewing? What's your first memory of someone sewing a quilting in your life? Do you have one of those? Oh, yeah. Well, um, my mom was a sewer, and I still have her sewing machine. And uh, it's a, a German faf mm-hmm. in a teakwood cabinet. So that's mine. Mm-hmm. And I grew up with my aunt sewing, and I sewed. So um, that's how I got started in handwork and I think everyone probably starts with sewing in some sort of way and so that's my memory uh, I used to make my clothes in high school yeah yeah that's cool yeah that's cool yeah um okay so copyright. copyright so a lot of people so we all live in a copyrighted world everything we do with copy everything functions within a world we make stuff every day your kids make stuff every day it's protected by copyright how are we to understand what this means? Because there isn't really copyright police per se, although people think they are. I don't know. How do you teach copyright to, to quilters and to crafters? Where do you start? Because this is what we're starting with in, in May. And the question is, and we're going to be talking to people, maybe you a bunch of times, but um, how, do we under, how do we help them understand what is copyright? Let's start there. What do you think copyright is at this stage? And I always start with the purpose of copyright in the United States mm-hmm. under the Constitution. Right, 188. Right? Yeah. And my entire talk, which I do quite frequently because my part of my job at Penn State is as the primary copyright educator for the community. I always, always start with why do we have copyright? What do we use it for? What's the purpose of copyright? And uh, just because you are talking to a group that is not working with copyright as copyright doesn't mean that they can't understand why we have copyright. Right. Because I think that always grounds the discussion in, um, you know, what should the outcome be? Right. What is a reasonable outcome for the average user? Right. And um, that's what I think is most important. You have to know the grounding. It's like you have to know the ground rules to be be able to understand how... You play in the system. Which, right. Yeah. Otherwise, you, you end up with unreasonable expectations of what users should be doing or right. misunderstandings of the law or, um, you know, any sort of undesirable outcome if you don't understand what the purpose is to begin with. All right. So what's the purpose of copyright then? Oh, 
well, to promote the progress of science <laughs> and the useful arts. Uh, and then I always also explain um, what is what is science, and science, science just is. means knowledge and learning, right? And, in constitution speak. Right, and promote uh, progress. Progress yeah. is utilitarian, right? Yes. So what does that mean? So what does promoting progress of knowledge mean? Well, I also like to explain that uh, in the United States, it's really uh, about an economic determination of how best to create incentives for the creation of copyrightable works mm-hmm. and the distribution of copyrightable works. Okay. It's not about protecting authors' rights. Yeah. Those are other countries and we that is not We don't do that here. That's not our regime. Yeah. And anything outside of that where it might be another regime, I do tend to to shove off to the side because I'm not really concerned with those other regimes. Right. Right, you just talk, you're talking about US law. And so yeah. the reason why we only care about US law is because we live in most well not that's not true of all of people in so what we care about is where's the infringement going to potentially happen so if you live in the u.s and you do something naughty and you get sued it's the u.s law that will likely apply would you right yes so if you are listening and you live in ghana which we have a listener in ghana um or um australia or japan and you do something naughty then likely Japanese law will apply or wherever you are. So it's ger- it's territorial. So that's why when you talk to library libraries here and people here, you focus on the U.S. law. Right. And that's going to be true of anywhere else. You know, do we, yeah. are, are, are we in France? Do we care about United States copyright law? Not so much. Right. Um, so, yeah, I'm always focused on what can the people that I am talking to do Right, because that's that's what they want that's to right. know, and I'm providing an right. answer for them. Okay, so we got to so copyright law is. Do, are you one of the people that believe copyright law is a trade system that it's all it's an economic trade system as opposed to like ex, a system of expression or creativity that it's like no. I'm gonna go maybe in between. In between, yeah. yeah. I think that it could have been. But then a whole bunch of people get involved and there's a whole bunch of people like me that make stuff and we muck up the system. So I don't think it's, I think it could, they think they would like it to be pure and trade-like, but it's. Yeah, it's not that pure. because it's not there's that pure. It's chaotic. Centuries of, of legal developments around copyright law and technology change. And it is not simple because originally the copyright law was not interpreted or written to be technology neutral right so i think if you were going to treat it as a sort of trade system it it wouldn't have had all these sort of various exceptions to the rules right that we do have because of different technologies and and right. things and tra- have different outcomes right due to their technology or media right okay so what is copyright copyright you said we said it's to promote the progress of useful knowledge but what is it? What? How do you explain to people when you're giving the lectures what copyright is? Well, it's this is probably the toughest part to get across. It is, isn't it? Why yeah. is that? It's uh, weird, right? Yeah, it's really... Like, I think, you know, you and I have a lot of copyright experience, like sitting on this couch, and I find it difficult to talk about. It's, it's hard to articulate. <laughs> it's and totally And for the hard. most part, people have to have some sort of intuitive grasp. Right. But it is a limited monopoly yes. over the right to exploit protectable expression. Okay, so yeah. give an example of what that means. That if I have a book, I have a limited monopoly, which means it's not absolute, mm-hmm. over exercising the enumerated copyright rights mm-hmm. So I make in a- the expressive work. All right, so I create something and I write a song. And the copyright law allows me to have the exclusive Don't use rights. Song. What? <laughs> well, I was afraid of pattern because then there's patterns harder. Yeah, you but know? song. Then we have music recording. Use That's book. True. Book. Yeah, go I with write book. a book. Read a book. I read a poem. I read a poem. Poems are bad too, right? <laughs> poems are bad too. <laughs> Because poems don't have a lot of economic. Well, I'm a very poems. famous poet, and my poems are very they they cost a lot of money. <laughs> okay, but poems sometimes I you know I had a discussion about <laughs> poems the other week, uh-huh. and uh, someone had asked a question about mm-hmm. 
uh, songwriting and, and and poetry. And I said, "Oh, they're the same thing. Like you know, let's right. not right. Let's not go there." <laughs> okay, so I make something, and I make I make a painting. Is it I a painting. useful article? <laughs> oh God! See, this is what. Okay, we're making a painting. We're making we, a painting. You painted a painting. I painted a painting. Is it original? Yes, it's original. It's work. totally original. Originality, though, isn't just like I'm the only first first person to ever paint a tree. That's not what originality no. is, right? What's originality? Well, just original. It's original to the author. I'm human. I have. That's you got to be human ish. I, I like to explain that first of all, it cannot be an animal. Right. <laughs> you can't be a computer an right. or supernatural being. Right. Yes. So no Cylons. Right. No. Nope. So my family sometimes thinks I'm a robot. Um, so you have to be at least part human. Hmm. I don't know if you have to be fully human. That's interesting. I hadn't thought about partial humanity. That's for another podcast. Right. Right. Yeah. All right. So origin. So I paint a painting. I'm a human. I'm not an animal. I'm not. I am an animal, but I'm not a human animal. I'm a human animal. I'm not an elephant. Elephants don't get copyright. Nope. So. Um, oh, uh, what a copyright lawyer, Heather, Heather Kubiak, sent me a book on um, cats who paint. It's all these paintings. So it's really great. Yeah. Anyway, um, those are not protected by copyright. Um, okay, so I'm a human and it has to have a modicum of creativity. All right. So it can't be the alphabet, although painting the alphabet would be creative. But it comes from a phone book. If you have a phone book and you alphabetize it, that we're not going to give you copyright on it. So... Let's say I meet the originality requirement. I'm a human. I get copyright. Mm-hmm. So now what? That's it? No. How, how long does my copyright last? That's the stuff I do, right? That's, like, it lasts a long time. Too long. And what do I get to do what, with it? What are we going to do in 100 years when everything is still protected? I think that the system is going to become obsolete because, you I know, hope so. I mean, it's like it's social media making it obsolete, like and all and I, YouTube making it obsolete. This is what I was talking about earlier right? today. Don't you think how many how many copyrighted works does someone produce in a single day? Hundreds, yes. everybody, and we don't enforce them, and we've got con- yes. and we contract around it, right? Yeah. So when you do the terms of use with uh, Facebook, yeah, you or, agree to a whole bunch Instagram. of crap, right? Yeah, right. And then we also all the orphans, like nobody's keeping no, the metadata on that stuff is crap. So nobody's going to know who actually holds a copyright in all those images. And who cares? Because the point of the system is an, it's an economic system, right? So unless there's ex- economic value in a particular photograph, most of the time people don't care. It defi- I mean, you could have a privacy issues or, you know, yeah, right, moral rights of, I don't want, you know, personhood theory. Like all these different theories of like why I don't want you to, so we were in the mall. This is like ridiculous. Co- I don't know. Well, anyway, we're just having fun chatting. But people would just be like, what was that? Um, so we took our kid to the mall. And we thought we were super smart because she was six years old and we brought a, she was way into painting. So we brought an easel to the mall <laughs> and had her painting on the mall at sunset. We were like awesome parents, right? So we were like so proud of ourselves. And she got done and it was a really cool painting. And Ron was like, I'm going to take a picture of it and put it on Facebook. And she was like, No. She's like, that's my painting, and you do not have the right to do it. <laughs> it was so awesome. I was like, yes, you are a copyright baby. It's so awesome. So, you know, you might have some situation where somebody doesn't want you to post something, but most of the time people want things posted. So copyright will become obsolete. Nobody will care. I don't know. All right, so what is copyright? Copyright is an economic system. You have to be human, have to have a little bit of creativity. It doesn't. In, it doesn't have to be... Originality isn't about, like, I'm not the only one that can make a log cabin, right? Or paint a, pa- paint a tree. That doesn't matter. Yeah, it's, it's not an invention. It's not an invention and doesn't have to. It's just you personally have put a little bit of creativity into it. A teeny tiny bit. Okay. So what do you get once you get a copyright? So it arises automatically. And then what happens? Well, then I'm able to exclusively... Uh, exercise or license my enumerated copyright rights. Yeah. Subject to the exceptions of copyright. Yeah. All right. So, what so, do you, I, you know, whenever I talk about <laughs> it, I do try to recognize also that much of the talk about copyright is circular. Totally. Right. I, yeah. I get all these things except what I don't. 
Right, right exactly. Yeah. So I paint the painting and I have the right to do what with it? I can reproduce it and make... To copy. Copy it. Perform. Perform it. Derive. But not if it's artwork, right? That's... You can't... Uh-oh. Right? Fail. Right. Yes, you can. What? Okay. Which Titanic. One? The movie Titanic, James yeah. Cameron. No, but isn't like artworks excluded from the right mm. to publicly perform? That's how you get those stupid, weird things where they reenact the art. N- I know it's a little, it's a bit of the a performance. The isn't it public performance? I believe that you can publicly perform an artwork in an audiovisual work. It, yeah, it's so know. narrow, it wouldn't even matter. Nobody because cares. Because the rights are overlapping. Right, totally. <clears throat> so, okay, so... I mean, you can also have philosoph- philosophical differences on how one interprets the act. Totally. But the rights are overlapping, and for... <laughs> They're so ridiculous. For so, for so many purposes, it doesn't make a difference whether you're talking about copying or derivative works, or... Um, uh, distributing it, or yeah. making a co- reproductive copy, yes, or... it's all the same it's thing all the same. for... Um, and it came out, and it's all like minutia and ridiculous. So, yes. okay, so I make a painting. I have the right to decide if I'm going to make copies of the painting or post it up on Instagram or put it on T-shirts mm-hmm. or publicly display it, right? I have all these rights, a whole bunch of rights, section 106 rights. But you say, what if like you decide to take my beautiful tra- painting of a tree and you do stuff with it? Like you comment on it or you take it and put stuff on it. I don't know. Like you you destroy it with your own art. The law says that's okay, right? Fair, fair use. It depends. It depends. <laughs> and I know people hate that. So I know. It totally depends. depends. I do that let's all the time. It depends to the circular talk about copyright. Okay, so I have an exclusive right, but at the same time, there's a whole bunch of other right, other other aspects of the law that says other people can use my stuff. So it's not, it's, it's not, it's not, it's not, I can't, it's not like a, I don't know. There's no absolute property right. No, because it's limited. It's limited. And what is it limited by? The Copyright Act. The Copyright Act. And in what ways is it limited? Well, first of all, copyright only extends insofar as Congress grants it in the United States. Right. Yeah, that's true. I hadn't thought it, about that part, but it's, yes, it's a, it's statutory. Yeah, it's not a natural right. It's no, it's a right um, granted by Congress. Yeah, and I'm going to back up back to the Constitution. You know that the Progress Clause is the only clause in the Constitution that gives a, a purpose for the power granted to Congress. Really? Yeah. Go read that puppy. <laughs> it is the right. only. It is the only power that provides. I love it. Yeah. All right. So. The purpose um, for which it is granted. Interesting. So 188 is the constitutional clause uh, for copyrights and patents. And that's what she's calling the progress clause. I start my IP class with that clause every single day. Every single day we start with that clause um, until they're sick of it. And they still, some of them get it wrong on the exam. It's really weird. Um all right. There's so, amendments that have the purpose in there, obviously, but the yeah. Constitution is originally written. Why I do you think, think they thought they had to put the purpose in? Because it was so such a large debate over granting this sort of monopoly. Mm-hmm. Um, but they had to. Yeah, they had to. It was originally that, you know, like to simplify all sorts of constitutional determinations and discussions and arguments over. Right. Over that, ownership of books. That they thought it was so necessary for the union to include it in the Constitution, but so dangerous right? that it had to have... Limitations. Yeah. It's really interesting. Yeah, and it would be great if it was interpreted properly, but it's not. Okay. Let's go back to fair use. All right, so yeah. we have, I, have a, I have made a painting. It's my painting. I get to decide what to do with it, and then you say not always, right? That's right. And what, what situations, give me examples of situations where I someone else can use my painting without asking my permission. So one situation would be um, where it's a trans, what we would call transformative use. Transformative use, yes. Transformative use. And whenever we look at, at fair use, we always look at, 
at four factors and none of them are determinative. Mm-hmm. And <laughs> it's such a messy world. All right. So what yeah, is we, we just kind of weigh them all together and and decide if it's good or bad after we look at all the four factors. Now I have to have to say I'm one of those people that like we've been coding fair use for like I don't know four years. And um, I think it's pretty obvious when you start get down to it. I mean, I think it changes, but I don't think it's as elusive as people make it out to be. I don't I'm think on, so either. I think like you start to look at every single case and they kind of fall in a certain way. Yeah. E- except the appropriation card cases, which are totally weird. But, um, yeah. right? Like, yeah. Yeah. Anyway, so fair use. Fair use says what? That it's not an infringement of copyright. And you're allowed to use my work. Well, it's still under copyright. So my tree, I yeah. make my tree painting, and then the oh. newspapers want to... The I tree have, is new. Hmm? You just introduced the tree. Oh, <laughs> I made a painting of a tree. <laughs> <laughs> and now I, people are going to comment on my tree. They're going to write reviews of my painting. Yes. They can do that. They They're going to say, it's the worst tree I've oh. ever seen. Oh, see, and I'm going to get you know really what, angry. But the thing is, I don't think that's right. So I'm going to tell yeah. them they can't have pictures of my tree and they can't use pictures of my tree to criticize it. And you're going to say... And, well, and you would also say, I will never give you permission right. to that's right. make a you're picture of my so tree. You're being so rude. I'm not, you cannot have a yeah. picture of my tree. And you say to that? Uh, well, I would say to that, uh, first of all, that fair use is really the embodiment of of First Amendment protections. Hugely. Right. Where we want to be able to ensure that the fact that we do have this limited monopoly of copyright doesn't endanger these core protections that that we want to protect under yeah, our totally. our federal laws, and Usually. one of the primary ones is is um, criticism and yeah, freedom of expression. That's right. That's right. And so that's a, the that would be a core fair use. That's actually how I got into yeah. uh, copyright because. I wanted to uh, use materials in my dissertation, and I didn't think I was going to get permission. And so I wanted to better understand fair use. And it was when all the J.D. Salinger stuff was happening, and fair use was it wasn't really clear. And I'm yeah. old; I'm so old. Like it was that time. Well, it's you know? changed so dramatically yeah, in the past twenty years. It's, it's. I wouldn't go to law school now because that being able to comment and criticize in a dissertation or a work is so much clearer now than it was, you know, twenty years ago, longer. So, it's really interesting. So, okay. So, I can comment and criticize. That's where we get news reporting and uh, uh, scholarship and documentary films, right? Except that documentary films have a whole bunch of other problems, which you've dealt with a bunch. Um, Okay. What about, I want, I want to make, you want to make fun of my tree. You're going to make, you're going to mock my tree. I am going to mock your tree. And can you do that? I can do that, and I don't need your permission <laughs> so to not do fair. that. Uh, right. Because the the purpose and character of yeah. my use, which is going to be the first factor that we look at, yeah. is when is that core protection, mm-hmm. and it's all for for criticism and comment. It's nearly always ninety nine point nine percent of the time going to outweigh all the other factors, unless right. for some reason yeah. that it appears to sort of just be a end run around. A license. A license. Yeah. Yeah. But it would, it, so it would have to be really kind so of like a So do you think, situation. so there was this, do you remember the Goldie Block stuff? The, did you see the, do you know the yeah. Goldie Block stuff? Where yeah, the they take commercial. The, yeah, they take a commercial and it was, what is it, was it? Um, it was a Beastie Boys. Beastie Boys about girls and it was a really, really, really not good song about girls and, and they turned it around and made it girl empowerment and then at the very end, it turned out to be a toy ad um, and they, Everybody, when it came out, and sort of the shock of all of it, they were like, it's a commercial. It's commercial use, and that trumps the comment and criticism. Do you think that w- was true with that case? I always thought it was weird that like everybody just was like, oh, yeah, it didn't go to court. But it was always like, commercialism. It's a commercial, so it, it trumps all of it. No, I, I don't. I, so don't either. I don't have... The fact that it is commercial does not mean that it's not It was not like protected. literally a commercial, yeah. right? But it, it's it's the same thing. I agree. Um, but commercial out being having being commercial generally goes against fair use, except when it's a parody or commenting or criticizing. Would you say? Probably not anymore. It depends. Yeah, it does depend. It, it 
All right. We, we're always going to say that it depends. It depends on how much is used, what the purpose is. Is it a comparison? Right. Um, it depends. Okay. So my tree. We had to have a different scenario. Uh, you love my tree. I love your tree. And you're going to make costumes of my tree and decorate all of your children as trees. And I'm not really happy about that. What about that? Is it protected under fair use there? Or is that a derivative work? And a derivative work is what? That's like using my original work to make a new work. Yes. Yeah. So what is that? Well, when, do, when do I get my rights? It seems like all these uses we're doing keep me from, uh, you're allowed to use it without asking my permission or paying me any money. But what about the costume one? Do you have to pay me, do you have to get my permission to make tree costumes? For my kids? Yeah. And that's it? Well, you might sell them on Etsy because they got really popular. Mm. And your Etsy store is really big deal because you know, you're, you are you are so amazing at the whole like making money thing, which you actually are. I'm, I'm you know? so amazing. Well, it's a transformative use, but is it? It does change the purpose know. and character of the use, but you can also characterize it as a derivative use, uh, derivative right. work. And let's talk about number two: how much and how good the amount right. and substantiality right. of the portion used. I use which, the whole tree. Yeah. How much and how good. Now little trees running And about. it's high definition tree usage. Mm-hmm. That's how good. Yeah. Because you're really good at what you do. No matter what you do, Brandy, you are actually very good at it. So your tree costumes yeah. are just, they, they rock. And what I'm going to say is that mm-hmm. it, it comes down to our fourth factor. Yeah. Right. The, my is, ability to license costumes of trees. Well... Right. Does the affect the market for totally. the original work? Yeah. Well, nobody else is going to make costumes now because you made such kick-ass ones. So uh, we have to swear yeah. a little bit because it turns out that if we have explicit, if I have to write explicit on it, um, our ratings go up <laughs> on the podcast. <laughs> it's so great. <laughs> so we only had one. First of all, she was super famous. So I don't think it actually was that. But she writes, she does quilts that are like... Um, use naughty words so I had to put explicit on the podcast because we talk about you know the F word and things like that and uh, it was our biggest podcast ever so (laughs) I I just Hmm. joke about like if it's naughty it's a a podcast about naughty quilting (laughs) naughty quilting yeah I can see how how that's going to be highly rated totally yeah well I mean it depends on how we're currently interpreting transformative (coughs) And the effect on the market, because yeah. a lot of times we use shorthand and say effect on the market. Mm-hmm. And the question is, is it an effect on the market for what? Yeah. Is it for the original work? Right. Right? Yeah. Uh, no, I think it's for, I think it's also my effect of the market on my deri- right to do derivative licensing. Yeah. Like I want to make t-shirts and other things. And yeah. now that you've usurped it, nobody wants to buy my, ver- like I don't, I was going to sell them to costume shop yeah. but nobody's going to be nobody buy. nobody wants to yeah and you know when it comes down to determining whether or not the outcome is good yeah we have to think about the purposes of having the copyright clause yeah which is does this undermine our constitutional purpose in having copyright yeah and if the answer is yes it undermines the actual purpose and doesn't have some greater purpose like protecting the first amendment then the answer is probably going to be that it's not a fair use. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. So it's really interesting. I've been interviewing, as you know, a bunch of people. And when I talk to people that have make things, they would do this thing where I'm, I ask them a question like, okay, well, I bought your pattern and I love it and I make it. You Are you cool with that? And they say yes. I'm like, okay, well, I bought them, and then other people wanted me to make your pattern. You're cool with that? I'm like, yeah, they're getting a little bit worse. And then I'm like, I bought it, and now I'm making and selling them on Etsy. And then it was like, then the next day is, well, I bought it, and I turned out to be a Chinese manufacturer company, and I now am making them in China. Now, obviously, it's that spectrum of commerciality. Like, if you're on one end, and it's just for your kid, people don't seem to care. That's kind of what crafts are all about. Yeah, but as it goes on that commercial spectrum, 
people get more and more cranky about infringement. I guess the question is, what is infringement? And why are, why is it, is it just commercial uses that we should be concerned about? Or is it something else? For me, it's really just commercial uses. Me too. Uh, you know, you, you don't buy a pattern in order to hang it on the wall. That's Although, true. Or you, fabric. You don't buy fabric to just have, I mean, some people have lots of stashes. But yeah. Right? But I, you're going to make could, stuff, right? What? You're going to make stuff with the fabric. That's you're going to make goal. stuff with the fabric. I, you could actually just staple it onto uh, like a, some canvas stretcher bars. Totally. Uh, yeah. I'm so doing that from now on. It's yeah. much easier. Oh, yeah. Like think about your studio with... Oh. Just a bunch of those. Mm-hmm. I think we could, I could sell, want to sell those on Etsy, right? Just like big pieces of fabric on well, canvas. Well, that is with a, the, those dish cases, right? <laughs> uh, and I think we st- actually still have a circuit split on we do. the incorporation the tiles? of yes, the, tiles? the tiles and the dishes. And yes. Can I incorporate a physical instantiation of a copyrighted work into a new work? And, right. And is that a derivative yeah. work or is that just a, like a frame? Yeah. So yeah. Um, this, is, this is very fruitful. But let's go back to okay. why we have a pattern. And the, right. pat- the, the purpose of the purpose the pa- of the pattern, the it, purpose of the fabric is to make a thing. Right. And is it, isn't there an implied license that you're going to make that stuff? Aren't you an implied yes. license to, ha- to make derivative works? Yes. There is an implied license to use the pattern to make derivative works yeah. for your own personal use. But, but so wait, wait, okay, stop. So that's the part that I don't understand is can they limit for own personal use? Like why is that? And is that because it's a, for sale doctrine doesn't come into play and that's my question is I don't think it's uh, with a physical pattern yeah with a physical pattern right. I do not think that you can limit what people do with it right what, what people do no no okay. with the with the expectations of the average user on purchasing a pattern even if you state they're they're on okay right, so let's let's what go, you would do with it let's like alter just a little bit Right now, it's a pattern for a dress. It's a dress pattern. It is a dress pattern. Can I make dresses to sell on Etsy with that pattern? <laughs> well, I think you now, can, right? now, now you've gone into sewing, right? Right, and, and sewing, sewing and is different because patterns in sewing are not going to be protected by copyright. Right. Right? The, well, let's, for the listeners, let's yeah. separate the, the pattern for cutting the pieces right. versus. The entire pattern, the pa- the sheet of paper, right? Are we talking about sewing now or are we talking about quilting? No, we're talking about sewing, but the okay. same is true of quilting, essentially. Okay. All right, go for it. So I have a <clears throat> pattern and it's got all that little, that paper that you can never fold back up. Yeah, or you have a digital pattern. There's lots of dressmakers. Or, oh, really? Yeah, we can get the digital patterns How and print them out. How do you print it out? Well, you print it out yourself and transfer oh it or something. Oh my God, I don't know. that sounds like too much work. Or you take work. it to a large format one. But there's lots of independent pattern companies where you can get yeah. way better, That's okay. way okay. better um, patterns than you then can like at simplicity or whatever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. All right, um, so I have a pattern. Yes, I have a pattern to make a dress, which is a useful article. A useful article, and a useful article. Is the copyright says we only protect things that are like pretty aesthetic separability. Right? Yes. Not pretty, like, judgy, but just, like, not useful. That they're expressive and not expressive, useful. Not useful. And if it's useful, then it has to be, like, patents or trade secrets or something yeah. like that. Yeah. So, in the United States, we do not protect dress design via copyright law, period. Ever. Except for when it's a cheerleader uniform. <laughs> <laughs> right. That's a really stupid case. It's All the right. stupidest. It's the stupidest. It's okay. You kind of feel like... You just want to be like... But say I have a, uh, an need innovative her. new dress design and it makes my boobs look awesome. Totally. Yeah. And yes. like I've lost 50 pounds. It's Fabulous. the best dress design ever. Uh-huh. It might be protectable under patent law. Right. If it meets right. all the standards of patentability. Yes. But it's not going to be protected under copyright law because no. it is a useful article. Right. That doesn't mean that the entire pattern as a whole is not protectable right. as to basically piracy. Right. Right. Which is ho- the wholesale duplication of the pattern. The including, pattern. Including so all not, the, the so, text and the layout and Right. So whatever. if so, I, I'm like, ah, like Brandy made this really cool pattern yeah. and I take it and I put my name on it and I make copies of it and I sell it. That's not cool. Copyright will protect the selection arrangement coordination of everything yes. in the pattern. It's very thin, but it's, it's it, thin. W- it will right. protect against the piracy. But when it comes down to the actual pieces, 
that give the, the basically make stuff? the instructions yeah. to make oh, oh, oh. to make the the dress that's yeah. not going to be protectable correct and um this is the essential problem when it comes to uh sewing and handwork um is that much of it is, is not, not protectable is not protectable um at all but we were we were talking about why we we buy the pattern, which right. is to make the pattern. Right, we and, make the pattern. So uh, yes, it can. may or may not be protected by copyright, but we make the pattern. Yeah. Now, if it, but uh, like I said, if it's a digital pattern, mm -hmm. that's going to change our analysis. Why? Because we can, um, and we we do have the to expectation make that uh, the copies the seller of the digital pattern has protected it via a license, and they can. Right. Oh, okay. So you're saying. Oh, I see what you're saying. Okay. Yeah. So you're saying that if I have a phys oh, it's going to freak people out. Okay. So if I have a pattern and I put it in a little baggie, clear baggie, and I send it to you, no restrictions on it, I can make it commercially or not commercially? Yeah. Can you say that again for me? Yeah. 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 Right? So even though they want to restrict the use of a pattern in a book, or in some sort of physical form, you can't do that. For sale doctrine applies. Yeah. Yeah. And um, But I, you're saying, this is where it gets freaky. You're saying that if I do it as a PDF, a digital pattern, and I send it to you by email or you download it on some system, it's not a sale. It's a license because... It is a license. It's considered software. Yeah. So, so it really depends on the terms of that particular license. And then you can limit and, it. But uh, you say that if I do it, as, so you have more vulnerability because you've now sent it as a PDF and it could be copied button and sent to all over the place really easily. Yeah. Right. But you could put a license on it to say no commercial use. Yeah. But, I, you know, if we push, came to shove, litigated that. Yeah. We might decide that. The public policy yeah. underlying the Copyright Act yeah. outweighs that, but and so it's what so no like no you can't put a license on a pattern, exactly, on th the particular sewing pattern that does not include the whole sheet of paper, right? We need to come up with two different words for pattern and pattern. This is unfortunate. Um, it is really stupid, isn't it? Yes. So one of the one of the points I wanted to make by yes. drawing you down that way is that. Okay. There have been attempts at actually legislating this, but it's gone nowhere. And I think in part because... Legislating what? Legislating... Actual enforcement of licenses for things like dress patterns, right? And it hasn't gone anywhere because why should the law make a legitimate purchaser of the pattern? Criminal. Yeah. For doing so, for, for purchasing it, right? When someone who happens along or or reverse engineers the dress, mm -hmm. I, I, so I remember I have my in, innovative new dress. Yeah, my boobs look great. I'm fifty pounds totally. lighter. Right, and I buy it. Uh, you buy it at the store. Right, right, and you rip out all the seams and you figure out how to do it and you make the pattern and you can do that with and you never bought the pattern. Right, yeah, or say you didn't buy it at the store. Um, yeah. You were just able to do it by looking at it. You didn't purchase it I'm at all. Super clever. Without purchasing. I'm yeah. so clever. The most clever. So, you know, why but that happens with patterns all the time, right? With patterns like quilting patterns. Yes. You look at the quilting pattern, you go, oh, it's just three circles and this and yeah. blah, blah, blah. And you don't buy the pattern because you could see already what it is. You're reverse yeah. engineering it there. Yeah. So, but there is a difference between the actual instructions yeah. of the three circles and whatnot yeah. and the styled illustration that you might like which is protectable right. uh or the directions right I, it's always yeah. the martha stewart example like when it when her show where she suggested people send in the cookie recipes it's because the recipes weren't protected but the book that she creates of all the recipes with the beautiful photographs is protectable yes and so that's what you're saying is that the pattern itself the way it looks and the style and all of that. The directions aren't protectable. The math isn't protectable. That's correct. But the beautiful pattern that's been created is protectable. Yes. The, so, yeah. There's there's a, still reasons why people right. create them and why people purchase them. Totally. Yeah. And it goes beyond the simple method of oh, hold on. actually following the, the pattern. You're st yeah.
Thrown it that way. <laughs> so, oh, we're on patterns. Patterns. Okay, so I'm a pattern maker. A pattern maker. They, um, they work really hard. So they much make, work goes into these patterns. So much work, and we really need them. Yeah, copyright law does not respect how much work you put into anything. They don't care. Does not care. So I make my pattern, and I get a distributor. The numbers are brutal for pattern people. So a pattern costs like twelve bucks. Yeah. Wholesale, six bucks. Distributor, they get like four bucks per pattern. Mm -hmm. It's got some protection. And then somebody copies it. I think this is where the moral compass thing comes into play. So is copyright, copyright law is not going to be super helpful. Yeah. Well, you know, the discussion about copyright doesn't mean that you can't have norms against... Uh, doesn't mean that you should not have norms that um, that's that protect the creators that are important to your community. And that is exactly what this project is about. Yeah. That's why people keep asking me, like, when are you going to do the copyright rules? Yeah. Because in this case, so a guild wants to do a pattern. And they take the pattern and they make a whole bunch of photocopies of it. And then the the pattern person finds out. A lot of recourse for, you know, 100 copies of it being sent out through a guild? Probably not, right? No. <laughs> because, first of all, right. it would have to be registered. Re registered. Right. And um, then, you know, to even get something going, you're going to have to hire a copyright lawyer. Right, who's going to take that case? Yeah. Nobody. Um, Unless just, it's like, just like, on like a, a guild that's out of control. Yeah. Like, like that they're, they've been, they're like crazy guild that's like, you know, doing, you know, or, or they've been made an example of, we're going to go after this guild to make them an example of, you know. Right. Like the Girl Scouts mm -hmm. and the Jamborees. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, but yeah. no, um, yeah. we'd have to register the work and hire a copyright lawyer and, yeah. um, you know, depending on the damages where we might be in the whole $10,000 before we get anywhere. Yeah, uh, and so the patterns, to, you know, and you, you would have gotten there's a hundred patterns, and it would have been probably wholesale, so it would have been six dollars. So you're in for like six hundred bucks. They should have paid you, and you've had to register the work that was like thirty five bucks plus hire an attorney and all kinds of other things. Yeah, right. So you're not going to go to court, but that doesn't mean, and what you're saying, social norms, that doesn't mean that that guild is scot free. Right? I don't know where Scott Free comes from. Is that a bad... What, where, why do we say Scott Free? It might be. It might be derogatory I towards the Scottish. it probably is, right? Yeah. Okay, not Scott Free. That's a really weird... Okay. So, uh, right. So, they've gotten away with it. They didn't pay for the pattern. And the, and everybody's upset. But for our society to work, our quilting society to work... We want people to make patterns. We, we want, do want people to make patterns. And we want to pay the pattern makers so yes. that they can have some sort of money to go do some sort of, go to a movie, yeah. right? They may be, some so of them. So what we do is we, we buy the patterns. To, pr to pr protect and support yes. the pattern makers. Yes. And again, wholesale copying of the pattern is still going to be infringement. Yeah. It's just direct piracy. When I... Again, and also when we talk about wholesale copying of a pattern, we do mean the entire sheet of paper or booklet, not right, just right. Uh, taking the instructions or methodology on how to yeah, create the block exactly. from it. Um, okay, so I make a pattern, and when the guilds are going to make, the, like a class is going to do it, or others, or friends. What about friends? So so we're saying buy the patterns Do we get to talk you're about good working people. copies now? Tell me about working copies. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, what what is the status of working copies in quilt land? You don't really have a working copy of a pattern, but I don't know what you mean by that. Tell me what you okay, mean by so that. Okay. So this is it's going to be very different in other sort of handwork communities where um, if you have a, an embroidery pattern, in order to actually complete the embroidery pattern, mm -hmm. you nearly always make a working copy. You mean like you're transferring onto the, you're making a No, not transferring. Um, you're going to photocopy 
your pattern so you don't mess right. up the original pattern. Oh, yes. My mom. Yes. That, so yeah, you might even do that with right? it. Yes. Oh, my mom used to do that all the time. Yeah, she, because I used to get in so it. much trouble. Oh, my gosh. Because I was so impatient. Yeah. And so I would start to mark the pattern, the, the original pattern. And I would get in so much trouble. No, you have to make a working copy. Yeah, I know. So let's... let's <laughs> I, I'm oh gonna, God, that takes we're, we're going to bring this all around to back to friends. Okay. Um, and then we're going to talk about what we can and cannot do and the norms friends, that right. we want to enforce as so some copyright patterns, communities. Right, right. So some patterns you have to like paper piecing or make this bigger or like there's directions that tell you to go photocopy the pattern. That's yeah. part of the That's, that's a license thing. to tell right. you to make that copy. And the working copy, they they recognize that you're going to make copies because you have to do stuff to it and you don't want to mess it up. It depends, right? So in in embroidery and, and especially cross-stitch, mm-hmm. uh, there is a really common refrain that you always have to have permission. Always. Really? Always, no. always, in order to make a copy. A personal copy? So you don't mess up the first one? Yes. Oh, that's stupid. Uh, so, And the same is not true in the knitting and crochet communities. Which I find very interesting. The community norm is that a working pattern is acceptable. And the law is that it is acceptable. Right. Well, right. Under, and unfortunately. So what part of the law is allowing you to make copies of the work? Uh, this is also fair use. Fair use. Right. Right. Because it's uh, personal use and you're not, you've already bought it. So it's not about yes. market failure and you're. Yes. And there's, there's no statement um, on a, on a copy uh, that is sold to you that could exempt you from being able to actually make your working copy what i mean by that is if i buy this cross stitch pattern and it says no copies even working copies may be made of this you can still make the working copy because it's a fair use right because it just because they write it on the back of the pattern doesn't mean it's true yeah i buy patterns all the time that tell me Oh, this is really fun. And yeah. I, again, I'm going to bring it all back together. Yeah. But that tell me that um, the pattern cannot be sold. And it's, I bought it in a physical form. Right. Right. So for a digital, a digital uh, pattern a where. A digital download. Um, you don't get the right to resell it. No right to resell it. And of course, they have to tell you those rights, which they always do. Um, right. So a digital yeah. copy, you don't have the right to resell it or to send it to friends. Yeah. No, no sending to friends. But a physical uh, copy. And, but it's so much more convenient that I nearly always choose. A physical copy. No, uh, the digital. Oh, you do? Yeah. Because uh, I, I don't care about, I don't personally care about reselling because I also know that it supports the needlework artists that yeah. I enjoy purchasing from because right. I'm my, the maximum limit of my creativity is changing mm-hmm. my thread colors, right? From the right. pattern. Uh, right. And so that's how I, I do. Uh, but, so can I can I share the physical pattern? The answer is yes, but I have to destroy all of my working copies before I share that. Why do you that. say that? Um, because the working copy... Is that your opinion? Or is that like... That, you that is my opinion of what the law is. <laughs> okay, well tell me why you think that. And Brandy is never wrong. She, yeah, I really... It's true. Really, and the purpose of the working copy mm-hmm. is to be able to work the pattern. Right. right. So if you're going to give away the pattern, you shouldn't be able to work the pattern. If you're going to give away the pattern, you should not you be, able be able to, work to work, keep working on it. Yeah. So either finish it up or destroy your working copies. You know, if you right, really want to market substitute, if I keep a working copy and I give you the pattern. Yes. It's just right. like making a, a an, an infringing copy. Right. But so I had this pattern that I did that I was very unsuccessful of of quilting and I really hated it and someone asked me they, they, they're like oh I love that pattern do you where did you get it and I'm like well I'll mail it to you because I had bought it right yeah and I felt very proud of my like um my uh for sale doctrine rights but then I thought well, should I make a copy just in case and I thought well that's a bit of infringement right yeah so like I'm keep I'm like what am, I can't like let go of it even though I hate it um but then I was like but Who's going to know? But I'm like, then I'll know. So it was like this yeah. moral dilemma of like, you know, where do I sit? So finally, I just didn't make a copy and I well, you, you shouldn't off. make a copy because... You shouldn't make a copy. The, the, that copy That's right. would be infringement now. That's right. Who would know that is another part of the Copyright Act, right? Right. Because we do not have perfect enforcement and that is the, how copyright is designed. Right. Uh, because copyright is um, directed at, at really kind of mass dist- distribution. Hugely. That's um, right. Or things that really infringe 
um, in a really dramatic way on the yeah. economic rights of, of the authors right. and copyright So owners. we as a society, as a quilting world or as the cross-stitch world, we yeah. have to say, look, if we want people to make patterns, if we want yeah. like beautiful things, then we're not going to make a copy. We're not going to give it to our friend and make a copy or we're not going to yeah. make a copy for our friend because that's taking money out of the pocket of the pattern maker. Right. And the problem with saying... And and I mentioned this earlier, um, before we started talking. Yeah, was um, there is a, a circular on copyright education from the National Needlework Association. Yeah, which is um, a trade association for needlework shops and needlework designers. It's not like the EGA, which is um, what's the EGA? Uh, Embroiderers Guild of America. Okay, and that is um, kind of like the Users Association. Yeah, right. The trade association says in order to make a fair use, you have to have permission, which is totally not, not true. true. Totally not true. Totally not, the not law. true. That's not the, the opposite of the law, right? Yeah. Fair use allows you to use it without permission. That's and the point. You of don't it. have to ask permission and get no. denied. Uh, you, uh, it's a user's right, and you can make right. a fair use of it. Yeah. Um, so, but, but by perpetuating the idea of Getting the law permission. being that you have to ask permission for each and every use. Yeah. Right? I think it undermines... The it, law. It, no, it undermines the community's efforts to protect what we value, which is not, you know, making sure that everyone follows um, the exact kind of line of copyright law. What we value is protecting... The source of inspiration That's and, right. and we want to support pattern the making That's and, right. and and That's right. and the designing. That's what we want to support. And when we say things that are the average user, you know, when you, we go back and think about what's the purpose of copyright law, right? right which is why I always talk about it. Um, so the average user can have an expectation of why things are the way that they are and, right. and what they should expect. Right. To be the outcome. So if the outcome is that it would be ridiculous to say that you couldn't have a working copy, what does that mean about the rest of their copyright education? Right. right? That it those things might also be ridiculous. Right. So it actually prom- might promote piracy instead right. of reduce right. it. Right. All because right. the average, me, when I make a working copy, which yeah. I can do on paper or I can do digitally. Right. I am not breaking any laws. No. And, um, you know, for Just someone to tell me that I am. Right. Right. Makes you mad. It makes me mad or it makes me more willing to ignore everything else they're saying. Ah. Yeah. So this is what I yeah. mean by undermining their copyright right. education. All right. So I have a couple questions. So first, there's best practices. So American universities put out a whole bunch of best practices. Do you feel like that would be something that crafting... Do you, is Are you cold? You're freezing, right? Do you want... Do you want to make it less cold in here? Like, I'm okay. Are you sure? Yes. We actually have the power to make it less cold. Because, but I, yeah. I, I also like being like under a blanket. Okay. Yeah. We have lots I'm, of I'm really weird. I'm, All right. cool. I'm weird well, about my Do you want like an actual quilt blanket? Do you want a better blanket? Yeah, not better. Your blanket's great. But I'm just saying, it's do you want a bigger? It's not a blanket. It's a wrap. Oh, it's a wrap. We'll mm-hmm. see. Okay. I'm not gonna wait. Well, there's it's lots a, of blankets around. It's so. ugly. It's this black and white thing. Mm, I only cute. wear it when I travel <laughs> because I can wear it as a blanket uh, yeah, and a seat and then yeah, totally as a jacket. That's right. yeah. totally great. Yeah. All right. Okay. So American does these best practices and we actually interviewed Pat. Um, I haven't posted it but because it got a little bit, I don't know. Anyway, so so what did American do? They got a bunch of people together. It started with documentary films. And it was a real problem. Documentary filmmakers, what kind of problems were documentary filmmakers having? Because you know them pretty intimately. So the problems that documentary filmmakers were having were that um, in order to show their films, they needed E&O insurance, which is errors and omissions. Right. Um, and they couldn't get that insurance unless they could say that they cleared or had permission for every single bit of copyrighted work in their films. And Even teeny tiny things. Like in the background, they would shoot something. Yes. Like we have a TARDIS, a picture, a, a illegal art, like this is unauthorized TARDIS art, and you would be filming us, and you'd get that, and then suddenly you'd have to clear it, and you couldn't clear it because it was illegal to begin with, and you'd have to clear it with the Doctor Who people. Right. And so they couldn't get E&O insurance, so um, they couldn't show it at festivals or have yeah. a distributor um, because no one... 
um, Everyone would, was afraid. would underwrite the insurance based on right. fair use of copyrighted works. It was in, too risky. Yeah, too risky. So um, that was the problem. And so what happened? Well, what happened is um, there's, based on the work of the best practices best practices for documentary filmmakers and them working with some underwriters who would write, you know, insurance for um, filmmakers who did rely on fair use. Mm -hmm. Um, It is now possible to get insurance for films that don't have everything cleared and would not otherwise pass the underwriting process. Because they do a a checklist on fair use, right? Yes. Yeah. Hold on, cat. Okay, so best practices. What about best practices, some, like a best practices thing? Maybe there is one for crafts or quilting or other things. I don't know if it's necessarily best practices and fair use because, you know, there's... It's bigger than that, I think. Yeah, like it's not... Fair use is, it plays sort of a unlimited role... In when we talk about copyright and handwork, which I didn't say before, but when I talk about handwork, I'm talking about embroidery, embroidery, quilting, crochet, quilting. Oh, I said quilting twice. Well, um, that's because it's knitting. the most important one. I'm knitting. just kidding. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Quilting. Well, all these things where we're worrying right. about, we're making things with our hands, and we're right. worrying about the patterns that we use to make them. Right. So, I call that handwork. I don't know if that's a technical name. That's just well, and they're like. Non-industrial. I mean, even if you're doing using a long arm or something, it's still like you're not mass producing it. Yeah, but it's it's interesting because there there's really no litigation on point, and such. Can I make a fabric of our lives? <laughs> such a part of the fabric of, really of you is, know right? American society Seriously, that right? that that all these things play a huge role in so many so many lives, and um, you know. The litigation that I see is in in this space is fabric companies, to yeah. fabric companies, or a movie studio that doesn't pay for the pattern that they use or something. Like, it's big industry fighting, you know, sometimes it's like a little guy fighting big industry, but it's not, it's not Aunt Sarah's made an Etsy pattern and, I mean, it's t- there's no, that's not what's happening, right? Like... I don't know. Like, where does... I mean, I think it's the Etsy problem is really what we're... So, when I make something and I put it up for auction at the school auction, whatever, and the charity or the or the church, it was small and little. But then social media happened and then also Etsy happened. And so, now I might make, you know, Skylander, the game Skylander. You probably know that game, right? Because you've got kids. Yeah. And, like, my kid asked me, hey, could we make Skylander hats? like for people and like sell them on Etsy. I was like, that's a great idea, right? It was like early on in Skylanders. Of course, we didn't do it because we didn't follow through. But then it's like, that's the commercial element. If we were just making Skylander hats in our neighborhood and there wasn't social media, nobody would care, right? Right. That's the enforceability aspect. So but now I make those Skylander hats and I put them on Etsy. Somebody might care, might not care. Right. And more likely, they don't care. In this day and age, it's gotten less and less. It depends on the it depends on the company. Yeah, well, there's right? there's been a lot of erosions of, let's say, what media companies have traditionally thought of as their rights. That's right, right. But it's so interesting, I'm, isn't it? It's not necessarily that they had the rights. Right. I'm, I'm not going to outline the <laughs> where the rights are, but they've always been, I would say, large and in charge. Right. And have the expectation that their rights extend this to really, everything. really far away. That's right. And we found out that they don't really. And they have, with Instagram and Etsy, they have lost. Right. They have totally they, lost. There's even YouTube, the, all the fandom art. You, right. you pointed all out this one. All the fandom art. Right. Yeah. And they also just recognize that they can't sue their fans. Like, that's not going to go well. So, you know, if yeah. a fan is making something like, what, a million dollars on something, when are they suing? I mean, that's one of the things we're trying to talk to content owners on. It's when it becomes an econ- economically competitive or they're making too much money 
or there's something super offensive maybe that they're not going after the, the it's you know. Preve- something that's preventing them from exploiting their works. Uh, you know about the firefly hats, right? No, tell me about the firefly hats. Okay, so you know how Jane has the the three, I think it's three colors. Okay. It's red, orange, and yellow hat. Sure. And um, so Firefly was not a commercial success. Right. And, um, but, but a fan obsession. Fa- fan obsession, huge Including fan obsession. And n- now, the, now they are exploiting, now, 2018, and back maybe like two years, they've started exploiting the rights in that work to create licensed items. Um, but before that, mm-hmm. no li- no licensed items whatsoever right. from Firefly. And so people started making Jane hats for a cosplay and then selling them on Etsy mm-hmm. because that's the only way to buy a Jane hat. Right. And um, right, it also has it. like this really awesome feel of authenticity because Jane's hat was made by his mom. And, you know, it's all these people hand making right, hugely. hats and selling right. them on Etsy. Um, and... Uh, there was a massive enforcement action. I don't. I don't think anyone got sued, and I haven't. I, you well, know, I don't know the it. details of this yeah. precisely. I don't think anyone got sued, but they all got taken down. And um, notice and take down. So notice they, they. Yeah. They told Etsy that they were infringing, and Etsy took them down. Yeah. And then they didn't put them back up. I don't think so. Interesting. And that so, isn't. That is another. That is a real, real enforcement mechanism, which is. Part of the Copyright Act, which says if you're put posting on a platform, the copyright holder complains, they'll take it down, and then you have some time to to counter it. But that's really where people might find uh, help, I guess. Like if you're a copyright holder and someone is posting something that's yours, that's yes, that's pretty much. But if it. you don't consider fair use, you're in trouble. In yeah. trouble. Yeah, you got to yeah. check, and make it sure. So I deal I deal with that a lot with uh, the I professors. Can't love this. That's so crazy. Right? The, they're always wanting to send takedown notices and like, well, really? Did you also contemplate whether it was a fair use or not? Because right. make sure to do that, please. I mean, that's what's so amazing about that case, right? That this is the Prince baby case that uh, that is a whole big thing, but it shifted the burden of copyright holders. Usually, said it's infringement, and then you would, the defense would be no, it's fair use. But now with notice and takedown, you are the copyright holder, and you have to do both, right? That it's it's mine, but I have to make sure there's no fair uses that were happening before yeah. I post the notice, which is super interesting. I love that. It's so messed. It's so interesting, and the physics it changes the physics of the system hugely. Although I don't know how much it's being actually enforced, but yeah, that I did want to bring that up because most of it's automated. Yeah, and I did a panel. This is the, the, okay, here's the tragedy. So I did a panel where I had, I was moderating at Copyright Society of, um, it was like, I think Google, Yahoo, and the Authors Guild, maybe somebody else was on it too. And it was all about, it was literally titled The Prince Baby Case, Future of the Prince Baby Case, and they didn't talk about it the entire hour and a half. I'm like, hi guys, like, what about the Prince Baby Case? They're like, talking about automation and all this other stuff. I'm like, yeah, but how does the Prince Baby Case impact on what you do? They're like, we don't want to talk about that. We'll talk about other things. Like, it was irrelevant. I was like, oh, well, that's really, really sad. That is sad. Yeah, it was bad. It was a really what bad. What are we moment. talking about now? Oh, enforcement. Enforcement. Yeah. Yeah. So yes, um, uh, brands have shown that where uh, their licenses mm-hmm. or their sales of licensed products could be in jeopardy, they yeah. they will enforce. That's right. So yeah. that's really helpful to understand. So and 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 mostly it's it is large brands or large media companies um, that are enforcing right. trademark characters. Or parts of trademark characters. Right. There's there's a a strong argument that um, the Jane hat is not protectable because it's clothing. Yeah, with a an orange, right? Red, yellow, a red, orange, yellow. I don't remember which order. Yeah. Pattern on it. Yeah. Um. That that may not be protectable at all because how can you protect against having an orange, red, yellow pattern? So interesting. Yeah. Except the yeah, trademark. So, so cool. But. Um, so cosplay and all that sort of brings us to the other side of copyright, which is I care about stuff so much that I make something like the personhood theory, the moral, the like locks labor theory, all that side of it, that it's not, I'm not making things because I'm planning to sell them, but because I love, the, love to make them. And I think that the, well, that's good for you. 
Right. Yeah. So what I think is interesting about this, this is my theory, not my theory, but just a theory maybe, is our system is a utilitarian system. It's all about economics and what we've been talking about. But it's infused with all of these people who feel the way about personhood or lock labor theory in this system so that they're nuisances in some way, right? A whole bunch of us making a whole bunch of stuff. The system would be much happier if that wasn't happening. But now they're starting to adapt, recognizing that we're free marketing or that that's exactly what should be happening, right? So it's a more complicated system in general. Everybody wants people to be posting stuff about their stuff. So there's more freedom right now, I think. Yeah. You know? Maybe not. I don't know. Okay. So I get all these emails from people now about, I saw somebody making a copy of somebody else's pattern or they were using this or it's like copyright police. It's like amateur copyright police that are concerned that somebody's doing something wrong. What do you say to all of that? Well, it's a tough one because you never want to tell a friend that they're doing something wrong. That's really hard. Um, so I don't, I don't really know except I don't know either. You know, to raise generally the question in a community, sometimes taking it past a one to one, one on one sort of Wait, what the so, what are the scolding so right, right is different than saying uh, you know to a larger group of people, you know, can we talk about copyright in this context or uh, making copies of patterns when it's not a working copy is wrong. Um, well, and I think it's social like norms. That. I think that it's just our, as a culture, we decide, look, we support pattern makers. So we respect their copyright. We respect paying them the fee, even though enforcement of that is going to be difficult if we don't do it. We, we should make shareable memes for Facebook. Yeah. Then you wouldn't have to have a direct confrontation. Shareable memes? Like, what would you do with your shareable I memes? have no idea what shareable a shareable copy- meme... About copyright? Copyright and handwork would be... <laughs> okay, we could do that. We can, we can make something. So, how are you to understand? So Passive aggressive. <laughs> right. So, I think that we respect pattern makers and we give them their $10. And we also recognize there are building blocks and some things that are not protectable so that we, we can make choices. Uh, what else? What about, uh, characters like Mickey Mouse and licensed fabric? They always ask about that part and we're almost done. I promise. I know we've gone on. For a licensed fabric? Yeah. Can I, if I buy the fabric, do you think I can? You already talked about that part. You're okay with it being Disney. So I buy, I I buy a yard of Disney fabric and I make pillows and I sell it on Etsy. Are you cool with that? Well, and Here's can the, licenses, can here, the salvage have the license that keeps me from doing stuff with it? Can the can the salvage have a license that keeps you from doing stuff with it? <sighs> I, I, we've been doing this salvage. Not, not, n- for me, yeah. no. No, I don't either. I think it's for sale. You know, it's, it's not digital. It's embodied in that physical object. That's right. I can do anything I want And it. it's, well, it's not like you're. But somebody said to me that you're creating, that it, is, is there implied right to make derivative works with that fabric? Or can they keep you from... There's an implied right to make the works with the fabric. Can I change it to that language? Tell me with that why. Well, because there, I could foresee a situation where you have so transformed the fabric that you have actually made a derivative work. Yeah, people do that all the time. They cut it yeah. out in this weird way or they do stuff or maybe they yeah. don't, right? The cutting out, though, that's still contemplated by it being on a fabric. That's that's the medium of which you have supplied the... Okay, so give me an example of when you've so transformed it from fabric that it would I create don't know. a derivative work. This is me saying it depends, and I can't think of It'd every eventuality, right? I can't think of one like that. But so I could... I want, um, There was one that said, because uh, we've been doing this big thing on looking at every, all these salvages, um, not for... 
for only for personal consumption. <laughs> I was like, I'm not going to eat this. Um, I do tell people they can eat the, the copies if they <laughs> wanted to. Yeah. They could. <laughs> That's okay. Okay. So, takeaway. What do you say to somebody when they say, teach me copyright? And how? what should I know? What are the, like the top three things I should know if you're doing quilting or handiwork about handwork about copyright? That making a copy of a pattern to resell or share with a friend is not nice. Is not nice. Don't and, do that. And is copyright infringement. It's copyright infringement. And yeah. you should feel... You and should, it undermines the incentives that copyright provides to right. the designers of the things that we want to protect. And, and even though our system doesn't work yeah. as well as it should, or maybe it works perfectly, just the fact that you're not going to get sued or thrown into jail, although you could go to jail if you do it, there is criminal copyright. Um, it's you're just not going right. to jail. You're not going to jail. You're not going to jail. But you should know, nobody's, very few people go to jail. But, uh, you should just, it's, it's not cool for the, the community. And you have to respect the pattern yeah. makers. And the whole essence of c- copyright, just because the enforcement me- mechanism's a bit broken, doesn't mean you shouldn't respect the, right. the creativity of the pattern maker and the need for the economics to buy the pattern and to not, and just to be respectful. Yes. Yeah. And also that is detrimental to uh, promulgate bad copyright information in the name of protecting designers. Yeah. Because that's not, that's that's not, not useful. Good either. Yeah. yeah. So don't say you have to get permission, blah, blah, blah. What right. would you say if you, because you are a very super smart, the smartest, what if you had, and you're not giving legal advice, but if you, if you're, if you were talking to pattern makers, what would you suggest they put on their license, like at the bottom of their pattern? Because right now they're putting all kinds of stuff. Well, that it, it that it's s- not contrary to what users can actually do. But I also suggest that they Just sell their the patterns copyright. digitally for the most part. Sell their patterns digitally and then put on any limitations they want to put on it. What limitations would you put on it? Say no for non-commercial use. I or, would say for non-commercial use, and you, you cannot transfer this pattern. Would you? Yes, put see, I would put that it? on a digital pattern. What would but, you? So give me. So, but uh, you'd put, but no don't put trans- it on a physical pattern. Can't do it on a physical pattern. Yeah, I have one. I'll, I'll, I have so, some really good ones over there. I'll should I? You. So I'm going to self redact the name. Yeah, they just retired, yeah. so everyone will figure that out. Um, who does any cross stitch whatsoever? Um, that says, you know, this pattern may not be sold and it's a physical pattern. And yes, of course, you can sell your pattern. You can sell your pattern. Yeah. Physical. So let's be really clear. If it's a physical pattern that you bought, you can sell it. You can give it to a friend. You can destroy it. You can do whatever you want you with it. You can eat the pattern. You can eat the pattern. But that's because of a thing called first sale doctrine, which allows us, like when you buy you a book. transfer the physical object from one person to the that's other. That's right. You don't get the copyright but you do get the uh, the ability... The property to, rights in the object. In the object. Yes. But in a really weird, because the copyright is weird. So we, weird. We don't do that with digital copies. So if it's a digital copy, why can't I transfer it to somebody? Because transferring it to someone means making a copy. Right. So, and you also, you said that we got a license. So it's not, it, first sale doctor doesn't apply to digital copies? No. Because you because don't get a physical copy. You get a copy of a copy. Well, you get, get a, copy. a digital instantiation of the expressive work. There's no actual difference. But this is the way the law is That's in right. the United States. That's right. The difference between like uploading and linking, right? If yeah. you upload a photograph, you're making a copy. But if you link to if it. If you embed it, yeah. You're okay. Yep. Yeah. We, we embed a lot. We love, embed a lot. Love, love linking embedding. Is in, on your business, yeah? No. Well, in your life. Your whole life. Yeah. Everything uh, you do. Everything. Absolutely everything. Yeah. Uh, Especially when it comes to creating course content. Yes. uh, That can be reused later outside of the the outlines of a course. Uh, You know, please use the API. Okay. 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 I have another question. Okay. So copyright. So if you have a pattern. Number three. Oh, what's number three? I don't know yet. Okay. Number one is, what was number one? Don't make copies for your friends. Don't make the copies. It's, it's, you know, as much as we talked about 
all these things that are, are not true. Mm-hmm. It is true that making you are infringing. Copies it's are, are, infringement. Are infringement of section 106. Yeah. And you can say that. You're infringing my infringing. You're yeah. you're, you're an infringer. That would be a legitimate complaint. Yeah. Um, and number two, you can you can sell your patterns, or I mean, you can the copies that you have, you can give away or whatever. That's why you can give away old magazines of quilting magazines, but not digital copies. That was number two. Yeah. Number three. What are we going to say for number three? Well, I think number three is like you know, just be a good citizen. Right? Like, maybe. Or maybe fair use. I don't know. I don't know. It gets more complicated. I think this is just the beginning. Maybe this is just one and two. I mean, you know. Yeah, well, I think I said... We haven't talked about what you just said as part of number one. Yeah. So, I'm not really good with bullet points. Yeah. I ramble. So, this is Elizabeth Townsend Guard. You've been listening to Just Want a Quilt, a research podcast coming out of Tulane University Law School. We want to hear from you. Join our army, our quilting army. Go to our Facebook page. Suggest people to be interviewed. Suggest yourself to be interviewed. We are excited to hear from you. But most importantly, I hope you get a chance to quilt today.